Hello, everybody, and welcome to this latest in the Values Jam guest session series. And Steve, brilliant to see you again. So to kick off, please introduce yourself and tell us a bit about the great work that you do. Right. Thanks, Alan. Um, so uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me as well. Uh, I do feel connected to this project uh, because over your shoulder, of course, you and probably over mine, you can see my one practices, which, of course, we, we worked on together, which was really fantastic. So um, thank you for inviting me. Um, I work in, I suppose it's really an interesting question. What do you do? Because the way I perceive it seems to be so different to other people. For me, I work in personal and, and professional development. Take away professional development. I work in personal development because I think that encompasses everything. And so I, I, I train coaches, train professional coaches. So that's one thing that's very, you know, very literal. I train professional coaches. I train people in neuro-linguistic programming, NLP which is essentially, and if you've read the book, anyone who's out there, then you will know what NLP is. Uh, it's, it's really about understanding how we process information, make meaning of our experience, and then our behavior based on the meaning we give our experience, which is heavily influenced, of course, by our values. Um, so NLP. I also train public speakers. I started my professional working life as an actor. So I trained at the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama in London and worked for over 10 years as a professional actor in theatre, radio, film, and television. And all of these things, for me, are about expressing the human condition, expressing who we are and our place in this world. That's really what it means to me. And I think I've always been on that voyage of discovery to see what it's really all about for us, what we're capable of. And that journey, for me, is a lifelong quest. And so I help other people, I think, if I was to sum up what I do, find what's important to them so that they can align with that and be more of themselves. Ultimately, I would say that's what it is. But if you look at the manifestation of that, it's in training people uh, to, to be coaches in NLP, in public speaking, which I think in order to become a great public speaker and connect with other people, which is what speaking is all about. It's not about you. It's about other people. You need to really understand how the world works, how people work. And great speaking is about being thought provoking, getting people to think about things in a different way. And, and so to me, these are all part and parcel of the same things. So it is about it is about personal excellence. It is about understanding who you are and what, what you want to achieve and then finding ways to achieve whatever that happens to be. And so there are there are many different ways that I go about that. But ultimately, the big picture is to help people be more of who they could potentially be um, and and the, the kind of person who they want to be, the, the revealing that and living it. And uh, I suppose that's that's what I do. And lots of different ways to do that. And what it what it is is it, it's about personal excellence. Thanks, Steve. And you practice what you preach as well, because I know that you've got some TEDx talks. And so, where would people find those? Yeah, so if you if you jump onto YouTube, the great thing about YouTube is just put the name in followed by TEDx talk, and then uh, if it's out there in the universe, you'll find it. So if you put Steve Payne TEDx talk, you'll get uh, how leveraging the laws of uh, the principles of flight uh, can. I forgot the title of my own speech there. <laughs> I really uh, enjoyed it. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, so basically, it's it's uh, leveraging the principles of flight, the laws of physics to enhance your personal and professional success. Um, and, and, it, and again, it's, it's about, I, I do believe that ultimately there are four forces that impact us in terms of what we do. And those are thrust. Um, and within thrust is your reason for, for whatever you do. And the values live front and center in thrust. And then lift, the things that lift us up, um, help us achieve those things, weight, the things that pull us down, and drag, the things that hold us back. And you can almost categorize everything into those four main forces. That's okay. what the talk is about. Well, I'm going to do a bit of lift. And I think <laughs> we're going to have some rust and not so much weight and drag in our conversation. Great. So I'm tip, some, tip some cards out. And uh, how many piles would you like to put in front of me? Uh, three piles. Okay. And I've made them different sizes. So would you like pile one, two, or three? I'm going to go for pile two. That's the biggest, Steve. <laughs> uh, well, there you go. I'm sure that means something. So uh, a number between one and 11. 
seven. Okay. Okay. So this is the card we have to play with today, a relationships. Wow. So what does relationships mean? And what does it look, feel, and sound like? Wow. I mean, that's that's an interesting one. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, again, what's going through my mind as soon as I saw that is, is I mean, that's really what I think I work with. Um, and really, that's what I think most of what we experience is all about. It's the relationships. What goes through my mind is, apart from the obvious personal relationships, but um, what really hits me is the relationship between everything, how everything is connected. Um, whether it's um, whether it's uh, you know human connection to nature, um, connection to systems. I'm, I'm on a, a hill where I'm sitting here overlooking Marbella. Uh, I've got a magnificent. I've got a mountain over there. I've got the, the Mediterranean there. And I've got Marbella in front of me. And from this height, you can see how everything is connected. You can see how everything is linked through road systems and and through the sea and everything else. And those are all relationships. How one thing relates to another. And so I think it's almost like a fabric of um, the universe relationships. Um, even just talking about the four forces a moment ago, you know, how they, the relationship between thrust, lift, weight, and drag determines if you have forward movement and flight, or if you stay on the ground or move backwards. And so I think that's really incredibly powerful. Uh, that's an interesting card to pull. Yeah, and it, well, just listening to what you said there, makes me think about how and i totally agree uh, you know no, nothing operates in isolation or in a vacuum it is inextricably connected to everything around it right and well, yet how much in our world is focused on the individual yeah you know and even in your professional space i'm not saying you personally but people that operate in your space tend to say, you know, I'm going to make you the best person you can be. And it's all about you and you're going to do this and you're going to do that, which seems to miss this whole point that we've just opened right at the beginning of the conversation that you're connected to everything around you. Yeah, absolutely. And what, what that sparks in my mind is the word ecology and, and, and then, you know, the study of consequences. Um, and this whole thing, you know, action and reaction. Um, but there's always <clears throat> there's always a response. A moment ago, um, uh, just before we started on the call, we were talking about, you know, I, I recently had a, a, a simple surgery, a simple surgery. Um, but one of the things that I was aware of is that something uh, so innocuous in a, in a part of the body that when you do something else, you suddenly realize how everything is connected because. Um, something you wouldn't have even thought about, you then begin to feel, you know, you feel the pain somewhere when you move and you realize that we're, we're, everything is totally interconnected. And, and then what sparks off in my mind when you say that about talking about you, 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 there is really no you because nothing happens without affecting other things. Um, one of the things that strikes me is, is, is the sort of polarity where so much of um, our communication seems to be focused around polarity. You're this or you're that. The Tory party conference is on at the moment, for example. Um, and politics is is um, is one of those divisive things that tends to also highlight polarity. It's this or that. But the interconnectivity means that actually almost nothing operates like that. Everything has a, a, has a relationship. Um, and most things are a mixture of things. And again, it's um, the relationship between almost anything is that nothing is nothing exists in isolation and i think i think that's really powerful so it, there is no you as such because you are part of a greater system and anything you do will have a knock-on effect somewhere else and i think that's really interesting yeah you've reminded me do, do you know um I, I keep this book close at hand um so Bohm Dialogue, David Bohm um, was originally an astrophysicist. And then later in his career, he started to become interested in philosophy. And he's uh, he, no longer with us, but an incredibly bright guy. And I really don't understand a lot of what he talks about. Um, but I think I do understand a bit. Um, so he talks about scientists being on a mission 
to break everything down into its smallest particles. And what he's saying is that that's kind of futile because nothing exists like that. Everything exists as one together. And my favorite example that he gives is of the, the night sky. And he says, you know, you look up at the night sky and what people tend to do is comment on the stars. But actually, the only reason you can see the stars is because of the black sky behind them. And the, you really need to appreciate the whole as one rather than, you know, identify a part of it, which helped. It, it was like it, for a lay person that was like, ah, yeah, I get that. Um, mm. So it's just reinforcing what you were saying about e you can't oversimplify things down into its bits and pieces because yeah. it has an impact on, on each other. Now, let, let's just play with the metaphor bit of relationships then. So what images come to mind? What sounds come to mind? What feelings come to mind when you think of that word? Yeah, um, one of the images that jumped into my mind was the world map. And I don't know if you've ever seen one of those world maps, I'm sure you have, where you, you have maybe cities highlighted as a bright dot, and then you have the lines drawn across, yeah. and you see this web, yeah. um, and, and how everything is interconnected. And, and that, that jumps to mind very strongly, because um, I, you know, I, sense, I sense that, because I think because of kind of the work I do, I, I look for the connections between things. I look for you know, the cause-effect relationships. And so I, 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 I see that web. Um, and I also feel a closeness because of that, uh, that connectivity. And it's very easy to feel isolated, for example. Um, and I think isolation to, to a large degree, a lesser or a greater degree, is, is, a, is just a product of interpretation. Because if, if, you, if you focus on isolation, you will, you, will, you will focus on the lack of stuff. But if you focus on, if you focus on the connection that you have to anything that's around you, it's it's almost the opposite, and and so, almost like that feeling of abundance comes from relationships. The feeling of, um, you know, growth comes from relationships. So the connectivity, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here, you know, between me and this table, for example, and I'm looking out the window at the trees and so on. I feel the connection between all of those things. I feel how, for example, somebody said to me yesterday, I was I was having a rant. Um, uh, I mean, I, I love the medical profession because obviously it, it helps us so much, but um, also sometimes there's a disconnect between scientific thinking and, and forgetting the patient. You know, all this wonderful stuff that people are able to do, but forgetting actually, as, as maybe some medical people might be thinking, oh, look, look at this and you do it like this. There's actually a patient at the other end of there. There's a relationship there too. And somebody mentioned to me uh, the impact between healing and and mindset so for example there are studies that show that if if somebody is in a hospital bed and they're looking out on a window that faces a brick wall there is a difference between that and looking out at a garden for example and so the relationship between ourselves and the environment has an impact on us which is greater um than than we're probably aware of and so I do sense the connectivity between there's bits of metal over here, for example, there's bits of wood, there's there's um, marble on the floor, and I and I do sense a connectivity between everything. So I, I'm I am a big picture thinker, I think, and I and I do see the connections between things, and so the relationships between things are really really important to me, um, and I and I do group things together. I, I sort for sameness rather than difference. Mm -hmm. uh, generally speaking and so so it is that sense of of you know the whole when we talk about gestalts for example or we talk about component parts of things it is how things come together and you and i both work in corporates as well we help corporates with you know values based things leadership these kinds of things and again that's another example of of a system made up of many different parts that can only function if those parts interact together and so I, 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 what comes to mind image-wise is that sense of linking, that sense of those lines that link disparate things together. Mm. Um, and that, that feels really strong when I think of relationships. Yeah, the, I went to the feelings metaphor first. And I, I, for me, relationships is 
something about um, emotion and also something about a magnetic force. So something that you don't quite understand or are able to articulate, but something that feels powerful and positive. Um, and I, I guess it was interesting as well, because you were talking about the relationship with various inanimate objects around you and your surroundings. And I haven't got that far. You know, I I got stuck at the people level of relationships and was just thinking about that. So that's that's an interesting difference. Um, and also there's something about, uh, and you were talking about the, the patient experience there. There is something about relationships being not scientific, you know, about being kind of the other end of that scale. So it's not necessarily about doing the right thing or the, the science. It's about doing what the other person feels and values and appreciates. So I don't know quite how you measure that. And uh, Maybe there have been some studies, but uh, it would be fascinating to see, for instance, you mentioned the garden versus the brick wall. It would be incredible to, to actually see evidence of how that impacted the patient experience. Yeah. And 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 their recovery times. Oh yeah. 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 And that, that that's an important second point because I, I think my work, like you mentioned, is does tend to start from the values place, but it ends up in the customer experience space. And you know, if you were able to explain to, let's say, a care company or a hospital that they were able to free up a bed three days early because they had a garden instead of a brick wall and translate that into the economic argument, how powerful that would be. Um, and it, it seems, uh, maybe we're veering off topic a little bit here, but it, it seems that in business, we sometimes forget the relationship between the component parts of the business and we focus on just the finance or just the customer experience or just the the physical built environment and just as we were saying with everything else it's not like that at all because a business is an holistic entity so let's um let's explore another question steve so just um, before you do that can i make a comment because that's because it has sparked something really important in me uh, I I am I really feel affected by atmosphere, uh, you know, in places that you go to and those kinds of things, and that's all about relationships too, and and thinking about the economic argument, I, I'm I'm somebody who, for example, I'm sat here now in in my house having a chat with you, uh, my if I'm working, and even when I had a in London I had an office, but I would go to the office, I would check my mail. And then I would go and sit in Costa Coffee and do my work in Costa Coffee because I, I needed to be around noise and people. Um, but I didn't want to talk to them. <laughs> but I just needed to be around them. And I would be super, super productive. And thinking about the economic argument, that I, I go to cafes a lot to work. It's part of the lifestyle, how I like to work. Um, but where do I go? Where do I spend my money? I go to places where I feel connection, yeah. where I feel that people see me. Where, where people greet me, where people treat me well. And I will travel sometimes quite long distances to go to those places. And there is an economic argument there. You create relationships and atmospheres. There's a definite, there's a definite economic argument there because you know, this at the literal level, that's where I go and spend a lot of money. And that's because of the relationship I feel between myself and, and the atmosphere I'm in. And I think that's incredibly important. And I know the work you do you know, a lot of the work that you do is is based. I, I remember I checked in, if I may say, I checked into a hotel at Gawick Airport that you're very familiar with, part of a, a chain that you did a lot of work with with my 31 practices, the 31 practices. And I remember um, there people making me feel really special, but also then taking a, a sticker from the computer screen and showing me that it was a value, for example, an associated behavior, which as, as in the, the 31 practices. But noticing the difference that that made, and I would often go and stay in that hotel when it wasn't the most convenient place to go, but because I felt good there. And I think that's incredibly important for anyone thinking about 
what's the benefit between sort of soft skills that people talk about or things like relationships and other things which are more tangible, you can measure more easily. Um, and I think it's a, a real missing a trick to not see the economic connection between good relationships and the economic benefit of that. Yeah. And I, I might I might guess wrong, but was it Yotel, Steve? It was. It was, yeah. yeah. And I, I remember um, when we first put the 31 practices into Yotel, after I think it was about six weeks, they had a board meeting and they were discussing how their customer service ratings had just jumped. And so my uh, point of contact was at that meeting and said, um, well, if nobody else has got a reason why this has happened, then it must be because we put the 31 practices in. And then one of her colleagues said, uh, well, that, you know, how can you just claim that? And she said, well, what else have we done different? And have you got any other suggestions? So the relationship there between implementing something and the, the results is sometimes tricky to understand. Um, but I guess that what I, I'm thinking is that that doesn't mean that you can ignore it. And perhaps sometimes we are over scientific with our attitude in that we want absolute proof rather than being guided by good reason. Uh, and there's a difference there. Um, mm. Yeah, thank thank you for pausing us there. That was uh, that was a good point. So the uh, the next question then, uh, and I'm toying whether we go one side of the coin or, or the other. Let's let we we've had a really positive start to this. So let's let's go down the darker side. <laughs> Where have you noticed a lack of strong relationships? Well, I mean, um, one place, just because of my recent experience last week, um, was, and, I, and again, I don't mean to knock the medical profession, but but it's something I've seen a number of times. And as a as a as a patient, as I was last week, um, the the disconnect between what somebody's doing and why they're really doing it, um, anywhere where we lose the point, i.e right at the end of everything that everybody does, for example, in the medical profession, is a patient, is a human being. And in in the, the maelstrom of all kinds of things that have to go on around something like the medical profession, it can be quite easy. And in business, you know, there's financial pressures, there's all kinds of things that can happen. There's um, there's competitors and there's all kinds of things going on. It, it Ultimately, you know, why are we in business? Why do we do what we do? And I think whenever there's a disconnect between the mechanical process of doing something and why we're ultimately doing that, when we lose sight of that, when the relationship, that relationship gets broken, I think we're in real trouble. And I think we really need to set back to basics. And, and this is because I do similar work to you in terms of values-based stuff. Um, I, I feel that really strongly. I feel it when I walk into companies and corporates and organizations. I feel it when I when I when I walk into um, you know the, the coffee shops or wh whatever it might be where people are doing things mechanically because this is how you make a cup of coffee, but forgetting that you're there for a bigger reason, which is to provide a service to somebody um, and and a, a, and enhance their life in some way. I think we often miss that relationship because we get caught up in the doing, yeah, um, and and forget why we're doing it ultimately not just to make money because you know to make money to pay for our bills at the end of the month is a very obvious reason why but i don't think people ask the question higher than that and why is that important and i think the the breaking of the relationship of why we do what we do not getting to that ultimate why is a real danger because that then impacts how we do what we do um and i think for me that's that's such a strong um, a strong thing to explore when re that relationship gets broken, when that relationship gets lost. I think we are, we are, this is like the old jobs worth, you know, you're doing something, but you don't know why you're doing it just because you've been told to do it. And I think when we lose the reason why we're doing something that impacts how we do it. Um, and I think that's, a, that impacts me so strongly. Yeah. Yeah. And so I've got, um, three things that you've 
put me right on um, with what you were saying there. So the first is Simon Sinek's great work around the golden circle and the why, the how, and the what. And, you know, for those people that haven't seen it, do check it out. It's just a, a great short video. And what he says is that in business, particularly, we tend to be focused on the what and we forget the why and the how. And yet it is the why and the how that really engages people at an emotional level. So, you know, how stupid is that to, to ignore that important part? So that's the first thing. The second thing is um, I did some work with uh, Nissan a number of years ago, and one of their kind of strap lines was, I think, a summary of what you've just been talking about, because they said they wanted to move from transactions to relationships in the way that they did business with their customers. And, uh, you know, it is this thing around, well, rather than going through the sales process, it's having somebody delighted with their purchase that's a really different perspective um and to to just put this into practical top context one of my favorite stories so i was involved in um service delivery for one of the big four banks in all of their offices around the uk and uh, it was the birmingham office where a really important investor was attending and i think you know this story already steve um but he arrived and the receptionist had pre-prepared his name badge because we knew that he was coming. Uh, what we attempted to do was greet people before they introduced themselves, if we knew that they were coming and we knew what they looked like to create that good impression. Um, anyway, the unexpected was that he had a terrier dog with him. Now, the receptionist, fortunately, was very much why and how rather than what. And so she said, ah, if you could lift up the dog, please, in front of the camera. And his name is, and made a name badge for the dog. And the, the guest went into the meeting room and said to the banking guys that were waiting for him, that's the best welcome I have had anywhere in the world. And then the meeting was a breeze. And afterwards, we would we teased the guy saying, you know, it was that receptionist that set you up for a successful meeting, not you guys. Um, but that's the difference between somebody who was focused on make this person feel welcome and impressed versus I've got to produce a name badge. I've got to write this person's name down, the time they arrived and all of that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. The workplace is, um, isn't it a fascinating place because there's the potential for strong relationships to create so much value. and yet. Uh, actually, a, a colleague of mine used to say, why is it that we invest so much time and effort and money in employee engagement? If we didn't turn people right off at the beginning, we wouldn't have to do all of that stuff. So yeah. what's that all about, Steve? Why are relationships not stronger in workplaces? Um, I, I think that's a good question. I think um, there's a lot of pressure in a workplace. Um, and also it's quite disparate. So you have different departments. And what can happen, I think, is you, you, that us and them syndrome, you would expect an organization, if there was an us and them, you may maybe about a competitor, and we talk about them. But I think you get that insider system. And when you get that insider system, it's like the system itself is tearing itself apart, where it's in, in classically, you might have that difference between sales and service, where sales might promise all kinds of things and service then have to deliver it. And then you often get this sort of us and them between you know, a sales department and a service department. And I think a lack of understanding, and I think it all comes down to communication. And for me, communication is about relationships. Um, you know, we, we have a propensity to fear the unknown. You know, we are hardwired for negative bias. Again, if you look at my TED talk, I mentioned that right at the beginning. And, and, and therefore, it's the lack of understanding, I think, which comes from a, a poor relationship that makes us maybe jump to conclusions and assumptions which are potentially negative. Um, and therefore, rather than, rather than um, enhancing life by having allies, what we tend to do, I think, is we we have more um, more potential combatants than we do allies, and it's and it's an illusion that we create inside our own minds. But if we were to talk to people more openly, if we were to communicate more openly, 
and therefore create stronger relationships. There would be more trust. And then I think operations within an organization would happen much more smoothly. Um, there would be more um, a sense of helping each other as opposed to that person's making my life more difficult. If, you know, th these kinds of thoughts that go on in our heads. And I think if we, if we were to have stronger communication, more understanding, um, and also a, back to the Simon Sinek thing again, um, and if you watch my TED talk again, uh, the thrust, the thrust is if we have, if we create cultures based on common purpose, um, and again, this comes back to the bigger picture of the why, um, you know, if if we know why we're doing something and, and we and we have people who work with us who share the same dream and the same goal and we want the same things, and we create therefore really strong relationships where all the effort and energy we're putting into things is moving in a unified direction, universal direction, we get much better results. And when those things break down, we often have the energy is pulling in different directions. So I think in organizations, if if the relationships aren't strong, if the trust isn't there, if the common purpose isn't there, then then what happens is we begin to have divisions within a within a system. And then you know somebody once described an organization to me as a dysfunctional family, and that's that's my experience when I go into organizations. And it's down to communication, it's down to understanding, and it's down to the quality of the relationships. Um, and that's all about unifying behind common purpose. And I think. I think those things are incredibly important in an organization. Um, again, I, 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 mean, I know we've referenced Simon Sinek a lot, but coming back to that that seminal talk, really, of his, the the first one, a TED Talk, when he talks about you know hiring people who believe what you believe, um, and that's about that's about understanding, that's about alignment, and that has to be about relationships. It has to be about communication and understanding and trust. And I think those things are so so fundamental. You know, we can get we can get lost in the noise of why something's not happening, but actually, if we really break it down, I think we get back to the simple simple things of uh, understanding, communication, and trust. And that is the quality of relationships that we create through those things. And I think most problems stem from that. Yeah, and it, it, I'm wondering as well, back to what we were talking about um, when we touched on David Bohm and the the science approach versus the more arts-based approach, where I think organizations, traditional ones, let's say, do tend to veer towards we want to break everything down into its individual component parts and we want to measure the hell out of an individual's productivity and that's how we're going to understand how the whole organization works but of course it doesn't does it because there's a tension between the people and the system and it's almost like in those situations where you're trying to manage from a system perspective, it fails to acknowledge the power and importance of the people perspective. And you can't, you can't, you just can't ignore that, no matter how much you try. Um, and now I'm gonna maybe contradict myself because um, you can't go the other way either. And I, I've been responsible for 50 million pound plus P&Ls. And you can't just say to everybody, hey, we're one team, do your best, <laughs> because that's yeah. going to work either. So it is this balance, I guess, is the word. It, it is this fine balance of being able to play with system and with people and go between the two and mm. do that at a high level and do that at a really granular operational level yeah. as appropriate, kind of all at the same time as you go which yeah. it sounds complex and i think it absolutely is and that's the point but you can't oversimplify this stuff and it takes a lot of skill to do it very very well and that's that's the reason why there aren't more businesses that actually do it very very well i completely agree with that and i you know i'm, I'm thinking back to polarity when we talked about polarity saying it's this or it's that uh, almost nothing in life is this or that. It is the blend of how these things inter interplay. And, um, you know, I think it's, uh, <clears throat> again, 
um, to to talk about, you know, Simon Sinek talked about also the infinite game and the finite game, you know, where the finite game is about more about crushing the opposition. It's about winning. Um, and often what that brings is short term vision where we might push some, something because we can and we want to to maybe maybe crush the opposition today. But what you often do is you make you make something unsustainable. You create an environment that people don't want to be in because in order to get there today means that you forget some of the the, the things that are also important to people. And therefore you might get a short term result, but you don't get an, you know, you don't get a long term sustainability. And this, you know, the infinite game um, is much more about creating a foundation, which means you're going to be here tomorrow, next month, next year, five years, as opposed to winning today, but being out of business next year. And I that's again about that blend that you talk about between between, for example, getting things done, which you have to, absolutely, but also creating an environment that people want to be there to get things done. And yeah. that is about a blend. That is about a mix. Yeah, and you, you also touched on short-term and long-term, and that made me think about the big difference from a relationships point of view. So just yesterday, uh, was it yesterday? I did my, anyway, I did my first LinkedIn live post, which was a bit scary because, you know, I'd never done it before. And it's like, well, when you press live, does this mean that it actually is live? And anyway, did it. And then got uh, a LinkedIn post from um, a lady called Betty Nurney, who I'd worked with 25 years ago. And we've kind of kept in touch a bit over that time, not not really close. Anyway, her her uh, email, uh, message said, uh, I really loved the video. Um, the Values Jam cards sound really interesting, blah, blah, blah. And it just struck me that I feel, and I'm not speaking for her, I'm speaking for me, I still feel a real warmth and strength of relationship even though we haven't had very many transactions over the years. And I was, uh, I, I'm thinking about this now, What what is that about? Because at the time, uh, so she was the human resources director when I was running a five-star hotel. And so we had a, a very close, positive working relationship. Then uh, she left, um, then we kind of didn't keep in touch and we not really had a great reason. She's in Ireland. Um, but it still feels really solid from my perspective. Um, so what's that about? It's a really interesting one. Um, the, the, it's, it's a bit like that question about if you're really good friends and you don't see each other for many years, and when you do connect again, it's almost as strong, if not as strong uh, as it was all those years ago. And it's um, it's something about you know the quality of the relationship isn't dependent on time. Yeah, it's it's dependent on other factors. Um, it's an interesting one. Uh, I was I was talking to somebody yesterday who, you know, uh, my my company started something like you know twelve years ago or something. Uh, this version, this company, and I remember that in those early days when we were felt like pioneers. You know, we, we, it was all new to us and it was all really exciting and all the emotions were really high. And when you start a business, you know, um, that that thing about are we going to succeed? Are we, you know, and, and you're doing things for the very first time. We had a, lots of groups that came through the company. Um, and because we were kind of learning together, there was there was a connection. But when I when I connect with people who were from that part of the journey, from that era, the relationships are so super strong, and then there's that that bit in the middle where you you know you do have relationships and they're great, um, and and I find it harder to remember some of the people from the the middle section, if you like, of the company's development. But the people who were there at the beginning in those first couple of years, it feels like yesterday. And every time every time I I connect with them like I did yesterday, they feel like family. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's bizarre. It's how it's it's palpable. You know, you can feel it. Yeah. And it's a really interesting point. I haven't spent that much time pondering that. But how is it that you can pick up like that? Yeah. Well, here. So here's a suggestion. And uh, I had this conversation with a client in Australia, and they're an insurance company, but they've got a fantastic approach to their employees. So basically, 
um, the, the chief executive says he wants his employees to be able to live their best lives because they work for their company. So for instance, if they have to go on a, a client trip, which is you know a day away or whatever it is, uh, he encourages them to spend recreational time around the, the work visit time to do stuff that they would otherwise not have been able to do or be, not been able to do so easily. So I remember suggesting to him, to him to consider how do you create uh, an environment where there are shared personal experiences for people. And the reason I mention this, <clears throat> excuse me, is because I think it touches on what you were describing. Uh, when you were in that formative stage of the company with other people, you were enjoying a shared personal experience. And that is what made the, the bond so strong Whereas when it moved on to the kind of middle years where it was a bit more transactional, there it didn't feel the same way. So I'm suggesting that that might be something to do with this. Yeah, yeah, and and that that feels right. You know, the the emotions are more heightened because the experience is 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 more heightened, and and that that feels like it fuses uh, something between people. Yeah, in a stronger way, as you say, when when things are are or are, are more level, more yeah. even, there is something about it, it's a bit like you know if you go on if you have a a holiday that, that goes disastrously wrong and you meet other people and you sort of get gather together because we you know, we tend to look for allies when things go wrong. Those heightened experiences, you know, you remember those vividly as opposed when everything is just normal. And I think there is something about heightened emotional experiences that that acts as a glue almost for experience. Yeah. yeah. And an important point there, Steve, is that I think it doesn't matter whether it's a positive heightened experience or a negative heightened experience. It's the fact that it's heightened that yeah. is the most important thing that creates that connection piece. Um, I'm probably there's some research or, or something around this space, so it'll be interesting to um, for people to either think about that or maybe investigate it. So mm. in Values Jam, there's uh, an opportunity to create uh, your own questions. So I'm going to invite you to do that now. Uh, so ask your own question about relationships, beginning with, who, what, where, when, why, or how? And this can be a question to yourself that you answer, or it can be a question to me, and I can start. It's up to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, How, what's going through my mind is, is you know, how can we how can we how can we raise the awareness of the importance of relationships, the power of relationships um, beyond the obvious, the, the day to day. Um, it, you know, um, and the reason for my question is that that I often get the impression, and, and whether it's, you know, it, I, I, I'm somebody who's affected by bad service. I don't, you know, it, 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 it triggers me when, when service is bad. Um, and, and I'm the opposite, that, that I, will, I will go to extraordinary lengths to go back to a place where the service is good. Um, and what, what amazes me is how, how something so seemingly simple and obvious doesn't seem to be that obvious and, and people don't put effort or as much effort as they could do into creating relationships, positive relationships. Um, and, and often I, and I feel that there's a lack of understanding as to the importance or the power of something so simple. And so my question is, how can we raise the awareness of the power of good relationships 
above the day-to-day level of, of understanding that I seem to see around me, <clears throat> if that makes sense. Yeah. And is that to yourself? <laughs> that's a question to you. That's a question to you. Um, and, and that's also a, that's a universal question, I think. Um, I, I, I am aware sometimes, for example, where I'm not creating good relationships. And I'm aware of it in the moment, for example. And 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 sometimes I will I will leave a situation knowing that I have left something in a worse state than it was when I worked in, walked into it because of my actions or reactions. Um, I'm, and, and I'm aware of that and I feel it in my gut. Um and sometimes I feel I feel the pull to go back and rectify. Very rarely do I do that. Um uh, but but I'm a, I'm a, I'm aware you know I'm someone who's kind of hyper aware of this because it's it's the area that I work in you know with leadership and with corporates and and, and with coaching and so on um and even though I'm really aware of it I'm also maybe that's why I'm so hyper aware when I fall foul of some basic principles which I think we should we should all be aware of um and play an active part in making relationships stronger and yet I'm, I'm aware that you know i don't always walk my talk you know um that even in the moment i might be aware that i'm i'm doing that yeah and still don't make the choice to pause and go back sometimes and afterwards i question myself as to why why did i continue on that path when i knew the outcome wasn't going to be positive for anybody and i think that's an interesting question i don't want to i don't want to split the question but um so even though i'm aware of it i in those instances and they don't happen a lot but every now and again they do in those instances i kind of almost break all the rules that i live by yeah um that's because you're a human being (laughs) steve yes (laughs) And I think to to get, have a stab at your answer, I think we've covered some of um, the answer in our conversation. And I've I've just written down three things. One is to keep um, the end goal top of mind. So if creating strong relationships or establishing relationships is the most important thing, then making sure that that is really in the front of your mind and that you do your best to stop all of the stuff that can get in the way of that getting in the way of that Uh, and so we talked about the remembering the why and so I, I think to maintain that is helpful then conscious practice because Without conscious practice, and I I use the examples a lot of either a top sports person or a musician, you know, the Rolling Stones do not turn up at a concert and hope that it's going to be okay. They've been performing at a world class level for like 60 years or whatever it is, but they still practice and there's a clue there. And yet we bowl around our lives hoping that it's going to be okay, rather than this conscious practice. So that would be my number two. Um, And thirdly is uh, reminding ourselves of the impact, both positive and negative. So when you do it well, the joy that you create. And here's a a quick story. I was visiting, um, it was my ex-mother-in-law if that's the right term anyway she's no longer with us but she was in a nursing home and I was she was a diabetic and I was trying to check up what she had to eat that day and there was a doctor uh, who walked past and he was writing some stuff down on a, a side unit and so I just stood there waiting for him to finish and he looked at me and I said hi how are you and he just, he looked at me and then a, a, a smile cracked on his face and he said, um, I'm on my 12th hour of this shift and you're the first person to ask me that question. And so immediately there was a, a relationship that was created there and I saw the impact. So 
reminding ourselves of the positive impact and also the negative impact. So when, you know, that that situation where for whatever reason, circumstances meant that you didn't do what you would normally do, um, to reflect on the negative that came out of that, and then to maybe just speculate about what the positive version could have been. So those are, uh, you know, this is your area of work rather than mine. So I feel a bit kind of guilty, but those would be my three um, first um, points, top of mind, conscious practice and reflect on the impact. Yeah, absolutely. I think those are all great things. Um, th there's always a choice point. There's always a the point where where it's like a split in the road. Uh, we could go that way or we could go that way. And there is always one of those. And and I think it's taking also those opportunities and not bypassing them, looking back and think, oh, it's gone. Um, and and often, you know, that's about taking a breath at that point so that you can make make a choice and 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 realizing the consequences, you know, being aware of that, that as you say, if you go down that path, then you know how how you know it's it's not nice i hope universally for all of us it's not nice to make another person feel bad you know the um the, the you know the consequences of that can be huge and i think the awareness of you know a a moment of victory can cause a lifetime of pain you know or or any length you know they they're in and you know our words are really powerful and they and they linger and and it's and it's it's the it's the consequences. So you know, pyrrhic victories. You might win an argument, but actually, not only do you make the other person feel bad, but that's going to eat away at you later too. And I think you know, one of the things about life experiences is, is is learning from the experience. And if we know that those things happen, and we recognize this as another point, which is an example of that. And and we take that breath, and we and we actually we use that choice point because we're aware of the consequences, and we're aware of you know that's that kind of victory that you get usually lasts, well, possibly doesn't last at all, but usually lasts seconds because the moment you walk away, it's it's like nobody's won, you haven't won, and you're going to feel bad, and it's and it's 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 that thing about being able this is this is the big thing about the choice that we're born with and realizing we have choice we don't have lizard brains anymore you know we it's not stimulus response we've gone beyond that to stimulus and maybe alter the response or even better stimulus and choose a different response we have that ability as human beings and it's and it's exercising that power that we have which i think some you know very often we don't do we, it's very easy to go knee jerk, um, and yet you know we are so much more sophisticated than that. So it's being aware of those things as well, and I think you know the wisdom that comes, and it is a wisdom, because we could choose to knee jerk, we could choose to stimulus response, and it's easier to do that. But there's always a consequence to that, and and one thing you know as we learn, as we learn about ourselves, as we learn about other people, as we learn about relationships. You know that accumulated knowledge can't be for nothing. You know it, it's there because it's an accumulated wisdom, and it's whether or not we tap into that. And and as we and there's always trigger points, so you know you're moving towards that. It's not it's not not usually that switch. It usually has a build. It's usually a strategy that we're running internally. That one thing leads to another, leads to another. And I think the earlier we recognize that, this is part of that awareness. The, we have a greater chance of doing something about it. So we never get to that moment. And because ultimately, linking it back, of course, to relationships, what we choose to do and say has a direct impact on the relationships that we are having around us and how we impact the system around us. And so I think it's the part of the wisdom of realizing you're on that trajectory, yeah. and therefore making an earlier intervention. Um, Rather than dealing dealing with the explosion, it's 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 stopping it before the fuse is lit, or as that fuse still has a long way to travel. You know, I think that's also important. Yeah, because of the consequences of the relationship. You know. Yeah. So, so there are two things there. Uh, one is you talked about we choose the response, and um, 
a lady called Fabienne Vales, who works in the education sector, uh, uses the word response, uh, I think, in a great way. So she talks about response ability. So response ability. So she, the ability to respond and to choose how you respond. I, I, I just, I remember being really struck. Uh, I'm not sure if she kind of came up with it in the first place, but uh, it's it's strong. And then the the other thing I think is something around, um, and you use the word wisdom. I, I think it feels like wisdom. I'm not sure if there's a, a different word that's more appropriate, but it's when you're faced with a set of circumstances or a situation and the ability not to get drawn down into the thing that you're having to deal with and having the wisdom or the ability to respond where you're still aware of everything that's around and the potential impact of what you might choose to do on everything that's around uh, rather than just get caught up with this little thing. Um, so that those those two things come to mind. Um, I'm conscious of time, Steve. And so to draw this values jam to a close, there's one final question, which is, what are you encouraged to do differently about relationships as a result of our conversation? Well, one thing immediately is um, the, those moments that we've just been talking about is to uh, to use that that uh, whether it's wisdom or whatever it might be, you know, that bigger pictureness um, to not go down the rabbit hole um, and and to to be able to maintain the bigger picture, and um, which is greater understanding. The bigger picture is greater understanding. Um, um, and I and I and I think it's. Um, it's really interesting because I will be walking around today now thinking of relationships, of course, um, uh, to, to 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 raise my awareness uh, of 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 the impact that all these connections have. Um, the impact of of if you take it back to the verb, you know, to relate. So relationship obviously is a is a noun, but put it back into the verb to relate, and so therefore, how are we relating to everything that's around us, um, and and to be more aware of intention? Because you mentioned it a moment ago, and I think this is really important. That if we don't lose sight of the intention, I think we're more likely to have better relationships and to relate in a more positive way, because there's a bigger picture and the bigger picture is the intention. And I think possibly it's to, to connect to that for the knock-on effect that that will have in terms of, of um, the, the way that I am viewing any situation that I'm in, in terms of how what I do impacts everything around me. And I think just, just to explore that, just to be aware, and even just to experiment, you said something a second ago about you saying hello to the doctor, how are you, rather, you know. Um, and I remember somebody experimenting on a course. Every morning they walked in, they would, there were some workmen working on something as, as they walked into the, the course. And every day they would, they would be different to notice the impact they had on the work people. Sometimes they would look at somebody, sort of stare them out and just keep walking. Other times they would say, hi, good morning. And they would notice how that impacted the response that they got. Um, and I and I think, and I think for me, it's um, it's it's now just to be more aware of the intention that I have, and make sure I'm serving the intention. And and if I do get into those moments that I described, to to earlier on, to be aware of the trajectory, to be aware of the fact I'm moving along that line, and to make a really connect to the bigger picture, make a much earlier intervention and just notice the difference that has to see if those kind of moments um, reduce or disappear. Of course, I'm human and not robots. So, um, but I've just, to see if I can, if I can use some of those, you, you gave us three strategies there for that. Um, and also that early intervention. And one of them, of course, was connecting to the bigger picture, just to actually be more conscious of applying that 
um, in much the way that my 31 practices does by by consciously applying behaviors in alignment with the value, you know, you, you get the benefit and after a while it becomes habitual. Mm. Um, so just to experiment with that, because I think that's um, really interesting. Connect to the bigger picture and make that determine um, how I am relating to what's ar- around me to make sure that that's in alignment and service of the bigger picture, mm. as well as with my values of wanting better relationships. And when... Uh, I'm, you know, uh, uh, this will be determined a bit by your circumstances today. So do you, will you have a chance to do that today or will it have to wait for another day? I will definitely have a chance to do that today. Yeah. Yeah. OK. And mine, I, I think I've got two. Um, I'm tempted to I'm going to put some time in my calendar at the towards the end of today and I'm going to reflect back on what choices I'd made through the course of the day, whether it was with other people or whether it was writing an email or whatever it was. And I'm just going to check to see how consciously I made those choices or whether I kind of just did the knee-jerk thing that we were talking earlier. And I'm going to be curious to see you know, how conscious or not my day has been. Um, and I'm not I'm, I don't have any expectation. I don't want to kind of I don't want to force it because I'm really curious to see how it will be. But I guess this conversation is naturally going to have an impact on it. Uh, that's the first one. The second one is I'm going to have a word with chat GPT to see if there's any research around this relationship. Do you see what I did there between heightened emotions and the creation of stronger relationships, because I'm feeling that there must be some stuff out there. And if I find something, I'll share it with you. Yeah, that would be interesting. I'm, I'm sure there must be. Uh, yeah. So I'd be interested to hear what you what you come across on that. So, yeah. All right. So, Steve, thank you very much for this Values Jam today. At the beginning, we were saying sometimes these are fun. I've, I've felt that I've had fun doing this and also... It has been deeply, deeply insightful. So thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. Uh, Great pleasure. And I'm really grateful for our relationship because um, through a mutual relationship with Richard, if you remember, um, looking over your shoulder, the the result of our relationship has been something tangible into the world, which you can see behind you there. Uh, And I'm very grateful for for, for stimulating all these, these kinds of thoughts because without that, we wouldn't get, you know, we wouldn't have had that and and also just the impact that that has because relationships are, are everywhere and the values aspect of this you've really brought it to the fore and, and you do in your work but also um, it's become much more front and center of my work as a result of the relationship that we've had as well so thank you for that brilliant take care cheers thanks alan all the best